You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Land. This podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Tiffany Cruikshank and Katya Bach, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. Hello, Nicole, and welcome to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Um, I was hoping we could start by talking a little bit about your personal and your professional background. And I read that you weren't, even though you have a PhD, I read that you weren't particularly science geeky when you were a kid. Is that true? That's true. Um, I honestly didn't get heavy in in appreci- for appreciation and love for science until it's, it's actually a funny story. I was in undergrad and um, I had decided to major in biology and was, you know, doing pretty good in all my classes. But freshman um, chemistry seemed to be kicking a lot of people's butts, but it wasn't kicking mine. <laughs> and I and I thought to myself everybody's failing and I'm doing really good in this. I must, I must be good at this. This must be my thing. And I enjoyed it. Hmm. And so, you know, it just took that, that noticing that it was easier for me than most people to really apply myself to it and really start to fall in love with science in general. And then how did you get to a PhD in molecular genetics? Even though I know what both of those two words mean individually, I don't know what they mean together. So feel free to explain. (laughs) So molecular genetics, I think it's kind of best explained uh, with my postdoctoral uh, research that I did. So when when you get an MD after that, you do a residency. When mm-hmm. you get a PhD after that, you do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship. Kind of the same thing, um, new on the job on the job training for your doctorate degree. And during my um, postdoctoral fellowship, I made transgenic mice. And so what that means is that we're used in in, um, biomedical research for humans. And so essentially what that means is I took special genes that we wanted to have expressed that aren't normally in mice, I put them in mice, and then, you know, wave my (laughs) magic wand. Aloha mora. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) And those genes were expressed and showed up uh, phenotypically or in a way that we can actually see it, it manifested within the mouse. So. Molecular just means you're working with things that are tiny, like Mm -hmm. DNA, RNA, proteins, and genetics means that you're just working with the genome of the organism. So, Uh, and I think (laughs) before before COVID, you were working in research around vaccines and immunity. Is that true? That is absolutely true. It's Mm. it's so crazy. Um, So before I went yoga full time, I was actually working at the University of Arkansas, um, developing and constructing vaccines that I used, that I then passed on to uh, pharmaceutical companies to test in animals. So it's kind of (laughs) crazy. Wow. So and I feel like in the last couple of years in general media, we've heard more about acquired immunity, natural immunity, DNA, yes. RNA than probably we ever have before. Oh, Do, have gosh, you seen yes. any sort of misconceptions or misunderstandings floating around that you are just <laughs> itching to correct? That is an understatement. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> yes, bet and any yes. that you want to use this platform to correct right now. Yes, <laughs> I, I have seen a lot of things. Um, I'm actually very active on TikTok, more so, you know, than I am on, on Instagram. I have mm-hmm. more, a more a bigger following on TikTok. And a lot of that came from me um, combating myths about COVID and the vaccine ah. um, on TikTok, um, just making informative videos. And it's it's so crazy, actually, how politicized this this, this thing is and if, if I'm being honest, unfortunately, all that politiz- politicization of COVID it started in America. Yeah, it started here, I think, and then it just kind of spread. Yeah, and just got worse out throughout the world. But um, and because it's politicized, people, 
you know, feel one way about it or they feel the other way. It's just mm. kind of, you know, in the U.S., we had the major parties are Democrat or Republican. And it's the COVID, how you feel about the COVID vaccine is kind of yeah. split exactly along those lines, which is unfortunate. It is, isn't it? Because it means that on both sides, there's information that's not making it through that firewall. We're not open enough yes. to listening about things that yes. might might challenge a little bit our, our worldview. Yes, it's it's extremely um unfortunate i i have friends on all ends of the spectrum all parts of the spectrum with what they believe in as far as the vaccine efficacy safety and 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 things like that so i just try to do my best um as a as someone with a doctorate degree who actually makes vaccines mm -hmm. <laughs> to dispel a lot of the um of the myths and the rumors and hopefully set some people's minds at ease about mm -hmm. it well, I'm not cool enough to be on TikTok, but maybe I should dip my toe in and, and have a look. Maybe I you should give should. it a try. <laughs> I actually like TikTok better than Instagram, if I'm being honest, oh. because it, it's just easier to be yourself on TikTok. I think on Instagram, everything has to be picture perfect and, you know, the lighting has to be amazing and all the angles have to be amazing. Um, and it's kind of really... You, you're not re rep presenting the most truest, uh, most authentic portrait of yourself on mm -hmm. Instagram because of those constraints. But on TikTok, none of that matters. People want to see and hear who you really are and what you really think and, you know, watch you do funny dances at the same time. <laughs> oh, no, wait. You just said the cardinal sin with <laughs> dancing. I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. No, no dancing. For uh, you me. know, what? I'm, I'm not a good dancer either, but, you know, I just I live my best life and, <laughs> and do what I think is fun. <laughs> and it and people obviously just, respond. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So yeah. in all of this science pathway and your studies, your PhD, and then you're doing postdoctoral research, when did yoga come into the picture? So yoga came into the picture right as I graduated um, with my PhD and before. So I got my PhD at the University of Arkansas and then moved uh, back home to Dallas in Texas to do the postdoctoral um, research at a, at a medical school in Dallas. And it started right at the, that exact moment that I moved mm -hmm. back to Dallas. Um, in my early 20s, in mid 20s, I'd been in a couple of car accidents that were that left you know a lot of residual pain in mm -hmm. my neck and my back and you know I went to the chiropractor and you know you get those adjustments and for me there was nothing that was going to absolutely be an end all or a cure mm -hmm. for the neck and the back pain um they offered me muscle relaxers and I'm like no I can't like how can you live your life like this no like we need to figure out what the problem is and fix it. Mm. And so, um, and of course, all those things, most of the time are all muscular. And when you go to a traditional um, Western medicine doctor, they're gonna try to treat those symptoms instead of figure out, you know, like, hey, this is muscular. This is what you could do aside from take a pill or a shot mm -hmm. or this or that. So, but I didn't know that all then. <laughs> all I knew is that I had whiplash and my neck was hurting and somebody suggested to try yoga. And the first class that I went to was a power yoga class. <laughs> and it was tough. You know, I thought I was going to pass out a couple of times, mm -hmm. but I made, I made it. <laughs> and I was just really impressed with um, the meditative state of, of the flow that a lot of the people in the class had. And and how strong and 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 um, flexible and just at peace that they seemed, mm -hmm. even though I was struggling, <laughs> they seemed at peace. Uh. And so, you know, it didn't the the intensity of the class didn't scare me off. I knew that you know one day that if I stayed diligent, that I could possibly be like the other people in the class. And so, I stuck with it. And I wonder if some of that attitude came from your sporting background. You sound like quite a high achieving athlete. So yes, not one to run from physical challenge. Yes. You know, I, I've had my butt kicked a few times in a, in an intense workout in college. So it was, it was okay for me. I just kept right on going. Mm. And how did your neck and back respond to power yoga? Did you... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it responded well like mm -hmm. I mean exactly how yoga is is if you if you're doing it right if you have the proper teachers and who teaching you how to the energetics that you should feel and the anatomy that you should feel in the poses it it's it, it actually works like mm -hmm. it's not 
I say that to people all the time, like this sounds cheesy, but <laughs> yoga can cure your neck pain. Like <laughs> it's I a cliche you know for that. a reason, people. <laughs> it, exactly. I tell people that it's a cliche for a reason. Um, but yeah, I, over time, I don't think it was very long, maybe a couple months, I started feeling a lot better within the neck. Um, obviously because of the strengthening that I was having in the neck and the upper back and the flexibility from the um the twists in the neck and the upper back. So yeah. Killed it mm. up. <laughs> mm. and probably a nice balance out from leaning over test tubes and beakers. That's the full extent of my scientific knowledge, by the way, <laughs> test tubes and beakers. <laughs> Petri dishes, Pete, there's another phrase for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so this is always a question that comes to mind when I talk to somebody who has a real job already. Why teacher training? You know, I know why I did teacher training. I was working for minimum wage and I loved yoga. So anything that would give me an out from the minimum wage job was worth a try. But when you already have a really yeah. interesting, challenging yeah. job and yeah. well-paid, presumably, why, why teacher training? Yeah. This is, this is an amazing question because I'll tell you my story first, and then I'll tell you a fact about my studio that's just mm. going to blow your mind. But I, you know, over the, the few years, I really grew so much from the practice of yoga Physically, of course, you know, I became more flexible, stronger, um, got rid of the neck and the back pain. But as most students do, it takes a couple of years to really tap into the mindfulness part of the mm-hmm. yoga and all all those other limbs <laughs> that you're supposed to be practicing aside from the asana. And so once I tapped into that and really started growing um, as a person and the transformation, the spiritual and mindfulness and transform- trans- transformative experience of that mm-hmm. began to take place. I felt that I had something to offer. I didn't know what it was, but there was something about this practice that I needed to offer to the general public. Like everybody should know about this and I'm the one that needs to tell them. (laughs) So, or I have, you know, I have a certain skill set that I think would make me um, a really good teacher and helping people with this, their own transformative experiences. Um, but it's funny that you say that, you know, you had a minimum wage job and why would you go from (laughs) being a doctor to a teacher? (laughs) I have at my studio, I have two doctors. There's me and I have a doctor of physical therapy that also just completed teacher training and works at the studio. Mm -hmm. I have an attorney. I have, um, an MBA and I have an architect. (laughs) So all of these really, really high achieving women, Um, or they're not leaving their jobs yet. They're, you know, they haven't left like me, but they are drawn to the practice of yoga and they feel the same thing that a calling to teach. So it's, it's really, I think it's interesting, but kind of crazy also. (laughs) And and maybe too, because it's a a power and hot yoga studio, it appeals Mm -hmm. to people who are pretty high achievers in whatever they tackle in life. Type A. <laughs> yeah, yeah, type A. Maybe that's it. We say type A. You guys are just not to be a. held down. You, you're gonna, you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it could be, but I, I think it's phenomenal. I really do. Oh, I do too. I think it's amazing. And the more uh, different people that we draw into the yoga world from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, the better, because the richer the experience yeah. becomes, and the 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 more varied words and voices that we're able to speak to people with. And I'm like, I'm like you, I think there's, there's really something to this yoga thing and people need to hear about it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So you did teacher training. And I remember from your presentation on the yoga medicine innovation conference that when you went for your first job, the experience was a fairly crushing one. Do you Mm -hmm. want to talk about that? Um, Well, I, I, I I'll preface with in, now that I think about it, I'm not sure that this matters where I'm located at in the country um, mm. with regards to diversity and inclusion within yoga, um, because I think it's a pretty prevalent problem all over the country. Um, but I'm in Arkansas, and the studio that I had been practicing at for a few years, um, after I got my teacher training, I went off to Dallas. And um, when I came back, I uh, auditioned to be um, a teacher on the schedule at the yoga studio that I was practicing at. And um, thinking back, still thinking back, even though I've been teaching several years now, did a pretty good interview, <laughs> a, pretty good, a pretty good first class, you know, 
me being type A, mm -hmm. I tried to practice and practice and practice and got everything down perfectly. Um, I gave a pretty good uh, um, example class and got really good feedback from all the teachers, except for um, one of the owners who, um, when talking to her later about the interview, told me that uh, I didn't belong, <laughs> that I didn't fit in at their studio. And me being a black woman, looking at a staff that is all white women, of course, the first thing that's going to come to my mind is I don't fit in you because within with your studio mm -hmm. because I'm not white. Mm -hmm. And um, so she said that I didn't fit in and she didn't really think anybody would relate to me or like me there. So and they're really protective of their, their community there. So they would not be hiring me. <laughs> and it took me a while to to realize um the subtle innuendos of racism and microaggressions in mm. that experience. But once I did realize it, I started speaking out about it and have really put that at the forefront of my career, speaking out about um, things like this, this that happen in the yoga community, because if we don't speak out about it, nobody's going to realize that it's actually happening and yeah. there's no change that can really be made so yeah i agree because the more i learn about microaggressions the more i realize i have inadvertently done in my life with no ill intention i've definitely right. said things to people that would make them feel a way that was not what i wanted them to feel not what i hoped they would feel and mm -hmm. i can't change yeah if i don't know i'm doing it so yeah we need right. to mm -hmm. we need to talk about it's, it even though it's uncomfortable yeah. Mm -hmm. And and of course, just like there are some um, microaggressions and things like that 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 have malicious intent behind them, there are those that don't. Mm. That those who tr there are people who truly don't know just because they've been brought up in this culture that that what they have said is something that could be taken offensively, or is that a, that's a microaggression? Totally, or even in another culture, because so many of those signals mm -hmm. are cultural. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Had you had yes. any kind of mm -hmm. foreshadowing of that experience in your teacher training or when you were a student, were you sitting in, in the room? Because you've, you've done everything I suggest to people in 200 hours. First, go to the studio that you've been practicing at because they know you, you know them, you know, you mm -hmm. know if it's a good fit for the, the kind of way that yes. you want to teach. And you did everything that I would suggest. Had you ever had a foreshadowing of that? So looking around the room going, oh, I'm the only dark skinned person in here, I guess you know, I, maybe I don't belong. Had you ever felt that before? Yes. I mean, I, I've, I have definitely felt othered, you know, is, is the term that we use um, when you just make someone feel either with your, your, your small movements or your, um, your attitudes or your language or the way you speak to somebody that makes them feel like they're not part of the, the normal, like they're mm -hmm. other. Um, so uh, yeah, I've experienced things like that throughout the entire time that I've been a yogi, you know, um, for most of all, you, mo the most prevalent one is that you walk into a yoga studio and like nobody talks to you. They talk yeah. to each other, but nobody talks to you or, you know, you might get stares or, or things like that. So not, there's a spectrum of microaggressions all the way down to othering things like staring or things like not talking. Mm. I've had other um, people of color tell me that people actually move their mats away from them when they laid their mats down. So, which is obviously, you know, there's a re I don't want to be next to you kind of situation. <laughs> and so I hadn't had anything that strongly. Mm. So this honestly was the very first, um, overt, um, thing that happened to me and I had no foreshadowing of it. Um, aside from the, you know, the little microaggressions that I experienced, um, in yoga classes but one thing that i did notice um afterwards and during my teacher training when i started leading teacher trainings was there was a huge there not a discrepancy there was absolutely no conversation in my teacher training about diversity mm -hmm. about inclusion about how to teach an inclusive class when it comes to race and diversity and gender and sexuality um, so I have made that a huge part of my teacher training throughout the entire training. We're harping on creating a safe space for everybody about diversity, about inclusion, about 
what how yoga really is a practice of inclusion and that if you're not holding space for diversity in your class then you're doing the practice of yoga a disservice i just want to leave a moment after that for that to sink in because i agree thank you and it sounds like that experience was unsettling enough, heartbreaking enough that you didn't teach for a little while. It took you, it took you a moment to gather your courage back up. Yes. Um, so when you have, like you said, these people know you, the studio, so go back there. Um, in, in my eyes, these people knew me and, you know, they'd been teaching for, for what I thought was forever. So they, they must know best. And so I kind of, you know, just put my tail between my legs and, and went home and just practice at home for a while. And actually, that's when I got on Instagram <laughs> after that happened. So I was like, huh, let me see what this Instagram thing is about. And I remember the first picture I took was an awful blurry picture of me doing a pro. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it every time I look at it. It's just like started from the bottom. Now we're here. Kind of How far have I come? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, that's when I got on Instagram and just really started to focus on my personal practice and developing my personal practice, um, and particularly the asana part of my practice, um, and started to really blossom and get a following on Instagram. I'm like, well, they didn't think that I was doing something right. Well, some people think that I'm doing something right. So mm -hmm. um, and a few months later, I had a, another studio owner at a different studio reach out to me. He was like, hey, would you please teach here? You know, I don't know what happened, why you're not teaching there, but I would love for you to teach. And so with trepidation, I kind of got my, my feet back wet teaching at a very small um, studio, just one or two classes a week that maybe had like three or four people in them. And you know, just really, really honing my teaching chops. And I'm just so appreciative and grateful for that time mm. at that little studio teaching those tiny classes. I do feel like even though it's not glamorous or exciting to teach small classes, gosh, you learn so much because there's an so environment much. where you're much more likely to ask questions and gather feedback and notice yes. details of people's experience. Yeah, that's a good foundation mm -hmm. for teaching, I think. It re I agree. I agree. And um, I now at the studio that I have now, you know, the teacher trainees, they they take me as the example of, of what they want to be like and what they aspire to be. And they see that my classes are always packed. Mm -hmm. And when they start teaching, they have like one or two people. And I'm like, now, now look, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Remember what you're here to do. You're mm -hmm. here to teach yoga and educate somebody about the awareness of their body and educate them about the practice of yoga. It doesn't matter if you're teaching the 20 or you're teaching the one, you show up the same way for one or for 20. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to build your class. First of all, is if you show up the same way, no matter who's in your class. But like you said, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to start to really hone and sharpen your teacher teaching skills and to know it, are the cues that I'm giving landing. Are the mm -hmm. cues that I'm giving correct? <laughs> Is are the things that I'm teaching safe? You know, are people resonating with the class? Are they tuning out? Are they checking out? Are they learning? Are they progressing? Mm -hmm. Which is a huge thing. Or you know, is the opposite the case? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I tell them to you know check your ego. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's you'll get there. that's probably the most important thing for a teacher to continue to do is just check your ego. Oh. I, Life yes. hands is plenty of opportunities for that to happen, or at oh, least yes. that's that's my experience. Whenever I start to feel like, oh, I'm getting pretty good at this teaching thing, the yeah. universe will hand me a little bit of smackdown, and I'll be like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's still exactly. a long way to go, <laughs> and it's tough. It, it's yeah. tough. No matter, I feel like no matter how long, how long you've been teaching, every once in a while, especially when you start to grow and get notoriety and popularity as a teacher, every once in a while you get an ego check, mm -hmm. and you have to be like. Mm -hmm. okay <laughs> and, and and to be okay with it and then you know kind of move on grow and learn and yes. move on so you've mentioned your studio I imagine that your experience after teacher training was part of what inspired you to create your own place and to create yes. it with real intention around who it would be for and how yes. it would be marketed and, you know, how people would feel when they came in the doors. Do you want to talk a little about your studio? Yes. Um, that experience that I had at my first audition 
was 100% the driving force about what brought about Elixir Yoga Lounge. Mm -hmm. Um, um, So after I taught at the little bitty studio, the tiny classes for a while, I got a job at a bigger studio and taught there for a couple of years. And you really just start to grow my presence in the yoga community as someone who was teaching things that people were excited to learn and um, teaching things that you were going to challenge people. I think yoga has such a misconception that it's just so boring and so just even, stretching. You know, it's uh, it's just stretching and it's so boring. And I'm not going to waste an hour when I could be doing a high hit workout doing yoga. Um, but the things that I was bringing to my classes were high intensity um, um, heart getting the heart rate up, good cardiovascular workouts, gaining strength workouts that people were looking for in a hit style workout, all combined with yoga. And so nobody else was doing that. And I, I gained a really good following um, for myself at that studio. And then I, um, I became a Lululemon ambassador. And I went to something called Ambassador Summit, which is where Lululemon invites their top 100 ambassadors, maybe you know about this, mm-hmm. um, to camp to um, Vancouver for a weekend of like intention and partying and learning <laughs> and growing. Um, and there was a session that we had um, in that conference that was about uh, false realities. And so whether things that you say about yourself or things that you believe are they actual realities or are they false realities things Mm -hmm. that you've created to be reality in your own mind but that aren't truly real for the rest of us and they asked us to do some journaling about ours and then volunteers to stand up and share so I raised my hand because I always like to share (laughs) and I stood up and in a moment of extreme vulnerability for me said that my um, true reality, not a false reality, but a true reality for me was that I would not be accepted as a competent, well-educated and highly regarded yoga teacher because I'm a black woman. And the room kind of got quiet. I'll bet. (laughs) Yeah, and the moderate, I don't think they were expecting that. And the moderator, um, who was um, a, a white lady, a white woman, she was like, well, is that, a, is that a false reality or is that a true reality? And I'm like, I think it's pretty true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and she was like, well, I think that could be a false reality. And it was like, I, I felt bad for her at the end because like people started throwing their hands up and like ripping her apart <laughs> for saying that this was something that was in my head mm-hmm. and not based in like factual things well it's and it's, i think T- i think tiffany was there now that i think about it she was there because she led the classes that at that summit oh wow um if you ask her about it you know after this she'll i'm sure she remembers that and um people just started saying hey no this is not a false reality mm-hmm. there is a lack of diversity in yoga there is racism in yoga what she's feeling is absolutely fact-based and it really sparked an amazing conversation amongst these 100 ambassadors and all of these higher ups and women that needed to happen but yeah. so many people are scared to have the conversation yeah it just never happens because we don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable but totally. i said to myself you know what screw it I- i'm gonna say this and I was nervous because, you know, there were all these, like I said, higher ups and <laughs> Lululemon there. And I was like, oh God, are they going to think that I'm a troublemaker? Are they going to think that, you know, I'm just complaining? Are they going to think that I'm an angry black woman? And mm-hmm. just finally all these things go through my head and I just said, screw it. I- I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to say it and whatever's going to happen happens. And the feedback was so amazing. I think that was either the first or second day there. And after that, I just had people coming at me the whole weekend being like, man, I just want to tell you, thank you. You're so courageous for speaking up and, and thank you for bringing this to the forefront of everybody's mind. And we really need to talk about this. So, and that was an amazing experience for me, first of all, because I had the courage to stand up and say that. Mm -hmm. 
and because at the end of the day, we just want to be accepted. Yeah. And I, I knew that, you know, me standing up and possibly causing trouble might lead to me not being accepted in this, in this environment of women to which I really wanted to be accepted. Um, but it was the opposite. <laughs> it had a really, really good um, effect on the whole weekend. And it brought out conversations that needed to be had for that weekend. And so at that conference, I, I, I di- discovered that my intention, what I want to devote my yoga career to is diversity, inclusion, and yoga. And not just saying, hey, we're diverse, <laughs> but actually putting in action that may make people uncomfortable mm-hmm. to bring about diversity, inclusion, and in yoga. And not only to do that, but to have a top-down bottom approach, a top-to-bottom approach mm-hmm. in diversity. I'm going to train diverse teachers so that they could be examples for people of color, for LGBTQ+, plus, for all body sizes that, hey, that person is teaching yoga. I aspire to be like that person. I'm welcome. And so I got the opportunity to actually rent <laughs> the space um, that the old Lou, the Lou Lemon was in, in Fayetteville, the city that I live in, because they were moving to another part in the same building. And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't want <laughs> No, I could not own a yoga studio. I don't know how to do that. Like, no, 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 no. And I think somebody else rented the space, but that fell through and they came back to me and they were like, are you sure? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Second chance. <laughs> I know. And I talked to my husband and he was like, why not? And I was like, I, I more than anybody, I trust my husband's opinion mm-hmm. on stuff like this. And so, because he's a very well-regarded entrepreneur and businessman, you know, within Arkansas. And so when he said, why not? I was like, oh, okay, well, he thinks I could do this. So, okay. (laughs) And, you know, I I took some time. I rented the space, took some time, put together a whole marketing, branding, like what do I want this to look like Mm -hmm. kind of of thing. This can't just be a, you know, another random studio. Hey, we're doing yoga in this room down here. Like it, it has to be different. It has to resonate with people. And most of all, it has to be founded with the vision and the values and the goals of diversity inclusion and so that's how elixir yoga lounge came to be Mm. and why elixir it makes me think of harry potter (laughs) (laughs) so kind of because it's a play off my my personal instagram which is yoga elixir Ah. (laughs) and which if you know the definition of elixir it's like some magical concoction that has the ability to do magical things right Mm. and that's what i think yoga is I think yoga is the elixir of life Mm -hmm. and we took the eyes out of it. So it's E-L-X-R instead of E-L-I-X-I-R because there's no I in T. Yes. (laughs) And so it's E-L-X-R yoga. I love it. That's great. So it's a, a really practical example of you being the change that you wanted to see in your own community and creating a space that would welcome people so that they wouldn't, have the kind of experience that you had had. I love that. Yes, yes. And that's you the, focus on, that's, sorry, carry on. Sorry, sorry. Um, that's, that's the entire reason why we are there. And whenever mm. I hire instructors, I tell them, this is the entire reason that we're here to make Don't screw it up. welcome. <laughs> well, and I, I try to hire people who I know who are in tune with the, with the values and goals of the studio, mm. that it's not just a job for them, but they mm. also have the passion to, to spread um, inclusion within yoga mm-hmm. and, and to actually fight for inclusion within yoga, not just say, like I said on our website, hey, we're inclusion, we include, you know, everybody, we're welcoming. Yeah. Which is yeah. what most studios do. <laughs> yeah. I think everybody thinks they're welcoming all but there's a lot of intangibles aren't there to walking in the room, yes. looking around the room and deciding whether you actually feel like you belong there or not. And I think yes. regardless of your skin color or body size or gender or whatever, I think we've all had the experience of feeling other or, you know, mm-hmm. unseen or unwelcomed in a space. Mm-hmm. So I think we can all relate to that feeling. Mm. Yeah. And the thing about it is you're, you're absolutely right. No matter, unless you're, you know, 
a five foot two, five foot two size four blonde, <laughs> which what we've been conditioned to think mm-hmm. yoga looks like. Unless you look like that, you probably at some time have felt a little bit othered. Um, and I'm sure even space. within that group, I'm sure there are levels yeah. of welcome. <laughs> I'm sure oh, yes. everybody's mm-hmm. got their insecurities and their their own mm-hmm. baggage, haven't they? So yes. your studio specializes, I think, in hot yoga and power vinyasa. Mm-hmm. And yes. I've spoken mm-hmm. on the podcast before about how I went through a period of teaching power vinyasa, which was fun, but was for me incredibly draining. As I was driving to the studio, I would have to play Mm -hmm. tool or rage against the machine as loud (laughs) as it would go to kind of rev me up and get me (gasps) some adrenaline. And and so I don't teach power vinyasa anymore because it took too much from me. But what is it about that really challenging physical practice that you feel kind of gives power to the people that you're teaching? Um, Well, the thing is, this is the thing that I say to them. If you can make it through 60 minutes of this, man, you can make it through anything. <laughs> and and that's, I, I feel like it's the truth, mm-hmm. you know, like if, if you can have your, I won't curse, butt handed to you, mm-hmm. you know, for an hour and, and you can, you can surpass that and you can grow from that. And most importantly, you can learn from that. Mm-hmm. Then what really in life can you not do? You know, this, this practice of power yoga is all about introducing physical adversity within the body and then using the breath and your mindfulness to overcome the adversity in an effort to transform physically. Obviously, yes, you're going to transform physically, which yoga is very good for the body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We've said that. And, and somebody who practices power yoga is somebody do, that who's going to, you know, have a strong spine, which is going to carry you through your old age. Very important. Yeah. A strong core and somebody that's going to have a strong set of hips. And um, somebody who practices power yoga is also going to be, be somebody who knows how to um, focus and who knows how to be mindful and find peace no matter what storm is raging around them. Mm. And so that's, that's what attracted me to the practice of power yoga. And most people that come to the studio, that's what really attracts them to it. Mm, I love that description. And to me, it really brings back the elixir uh, visual in my mind, because it's yeah. all about the, the, the right medicine, isn't it? The right, the yes. right ingredients, the right dose, the right timing mm-hmm. to give people mm-hmm. the medicine that they need. So yes. when you're making your way through your day and you need to feel more kind of strong or more sure or more confident, what sort of practices Mm -hmm. do you find yourself turning to? The funny thing is, is that, and people, I I get this all the time. People think I practice power yoga at home. like (laughs) (laughs) By the fire. Yeah, I I don't practice power yoga at home. I very rarely do vinyasa at home. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I do most, almost all yin and hatha at home Mm. with, with an inversion practice and a strength practice, like, you know, but I, I, if I want to do vinyasa, I go to my studio. I let somebody else guide me through the practice. You know what I mean? Yeah. But at at home, I, I love yin to work on, um, you know, obviously flexibility and to work on the joints, keeping them safe and healthy. And I love inversions. And so that in hatha. So that's pretty much why I practice at home. When mm. I want hot power, I go let one of my teachers teach me. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure isn't stressful for them at all. <laughs> I had, we had this conversation. They wanted to know, because I would sign up to save a spot in their class. I would sign myself up. And so they would be like, oh, I'm, I'm thinking all week. I'm thinking that she's coming. She's coming. She's coming. And I'm like, well, do you want me to sign up or you want me to just show up? <laughs> Yeah, there's pros and cons to that. My goodness. Yeah. yeah. And so they said they just want me to show up. They don't want me to show up. <laughs> I guess it kind of compresses the period of nerves into a much smaller space where they, well, I've, yes. you know, I've got my class plan. It is what it is. It's too late to change. Exactly. Just have to go exactly. in there and do my best. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and to me, the, the flip side, for where there's a yin, there's always a yang. So yes. for me, 
feeling kind of strong and confident uh, and decisive in my life sometimes requires softness and quietness. And, and yes. I was going to ask you about the kind of practices that you do to cultivate that, but it, it sounds like yin, you've already spoken yes. about some, right. some softness and quiet. The, I, I'm a, my doshas, I'm a pitta, mm-hmm. <laughs> which you could probably guess. Could have guessed. <laughs> um, I'm a pitta, I'm very high energy. I'm, you know, go, go, go. And so when I'm at home, I, I need, I need to mm. calm down. I need to relax all that, all that fiery energy. So yin, yin and hatha are the things that I do. And even, you know, the inversion practice, the handstands have become a more meditative thing mm. for me instead of a struggle. Like it used to, you have to get to that point, obviously, yeah. <laughs> to where handstands are not, you know, a struggle that they're very um, mindful and very um, meditative. And uh, that's why I can do a handstand practice 30 minutes before bed and just sleep fine. And people are like, how do you do that? I'm like, it's, it's more, it's mm. not, it's not like it is for you. <laughs> like it It's more about focus. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's probably never going to happen for me, but I, I, <laughs> I like the visual. I like to imagine it. I can definitely imagine that. Um, yeah. So February is Black History Month in U- the United States, and I wonder whether that month has any particular meaning for you, given your mission to increase diversity and inclusion in your community. Yes, so um, two times a year, we really, um, as far as marketing and everything else, diversity and inclusion is is a, is a goal and a mission for us. Three hundred sixty five days a year, mm-hmm. but I feel like the mo- the majority of the world focuses on them in February, Black History Month, and and during the month of Pride. And so those are two times of the year that we that we also focus and market heavily on those things, but we also talk about these things 365 days a year. Yeah. Um, and Black History Month obviously holds special meaning for me and my family and my studio because it is a celebration of things um, that people of color have had, Black people have had to overcome the United States and are still working to overcome. So I, I feel like a, a broken record I, every February, I make a, um, a a post on my Instagram and on the studio. It's like on March 1st, it's like, okay, now what? Yeah. <laughs> Black, Black History Month is over. So are you going to keep that same energy on March 30th, on August 30th, mm-hmm. in December? Or is it something that you're only going to talk about for likes, follows, and views in February? Because unless you're talking about it, unless you're living it, 365 days a year, there can't be change that is brought about by just talking about it in February and Mm -hmm. posting, like we talked about, I have a dream. Yeah. So these are something that needs to be worked on all year, Mm. not just during these special months. And I always tell people or post on my personal Instagram, it's like, hey, all of these businesses are posting happy Black History Month (laughs) on their socials. Like, Pay attention to the ones who are talking about diversity and inclusion all months of the year, not just yeah. this month, mm-hmm. because those are the ones who mean it. And I love that you mentioned Pride Month there too, because it's the same yeah. that I hear from people in the LGBTQ community as well. Of you know, it's it's great, it's great that there's Pride Month, but there are also eleven other months of the year that things need to change. So, one hundred percent. I yeah. have, um, I have. Uh, one, two, three. I think we have four black teachers at the studio at my studio. We have one Asian American teacher and we have two LGBTQ plus. And I'm just so proud about all of that. Mm-hmm. Just as proud about that the LGBTQ plus teachers than as I am about the teachers of color. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's all part of the same fight. It's all part of the same fight. Yeah. Marginalization is marginalization, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Yes. You wrote something that I read in my super creepy deep dive of research for the podcast. <laughs> I always feel creepy. quite. Uh, <laughs> it feels kind of creepy. All the time. 
it's it's there for you to li- read it. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. I do feel slightly like a stalker, but I found something that you wrote that that really resonated for me because I live in the South Island of New Zealand, which is a, it's a pretty pasty place to live. Most people look pretty much the same, although there's a bit of immigration from South America, but it, it's not a massively diverse place. And and you wrote in the Scout Guide, ask yourself. How many black yoga teachers have you ever had in your life? The next time you go to a yoga class, look around. How many black people do you see practicing with you? There's so much room for growth and the time for that growth is now. Now is the time to highlight black yoga instructors and give black yoga teachers a platform to speak and teach. Now is the time to listen to black yoga students as they share their experiences Now is the time to hire black yoga teachers instead of perpetuating the stereotype that they are not skilled, not competent, not marketable. Now is the time to speak about racial biases and racism within the yoga world. Until these things happen, yoga will remain a whitewashed and exclusive entity in this country and I'd add in all countries. So you've highlighted some really concrete actions here that people could take hiring more diverse teachers, talking more about racial bias, listening to voices that have been marginalized, creating spaces that are more welcoming. How else would you like to see the yoga world change and evolve? Um, For sure, marketing towards people of color Mm. and marginalized groups and men. If you think about it, who do you see all your yoga ads geared towards? White women. Right. Mm-hmm. White women who it, 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 the energy coming comes off the ad as they have um, a lot of money. <laughs> so affluent white women is who mm-hmm. you see most yoga ads targeted towards that skinny. And yeah. And that's that's one thing that I vowed to never do at Elixir Yoga Lounge was not create marketing that was specifically geared towards that group. Because if we're honest, that group is going to come to yoga no matter what you say in your marketing, right? But the black man or, Mm -hmm. you know, the woman who's considered overweight Mm -hmm. or somebody who is trans, who's marketing towards them? Mm. Nobody. And so in their mind, they think, well, I'm not welcome because I don't see any marketing that looks like me. The thing about, I give this example all the time of Walmart. Feel how you feel about Walmart, right? (laughs) You think they're a great company. You think they're a bad company. One thing that Walmart kills the game at is marketing towards minorities. They, if you walk into a Walmart store, you see pictures of people of color, color everywhere. And because of that, I think that's a huge reason. There's other reasons, obviously, but that's a huge reason why Walmart is one of the biggest companies in the world because they don't specifically market towards just one tiny niche of person. They Mm. market towards everybody, which makes everybody feel welcome Mm. to shop at their store. Because I have to say, as a sort of blondish white woman, none of that marketing speaks to me. I don't see myself in that super skinny model who's doing tree pose right. on a hilltop, even though there's plenty of pictures <laughs> of me doing tree pose on a hilltop. I don't see myself in that marketing. It doesn't speak right. to me. So if it's not even speaking to me, who the right. hell is it speaking to? Who is it speaking to? <laughs> and, and that's the thing too. You talk about the pretty tree pose. Another thing is that I've vowed to, to do not to do in our marketing is showcase perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Because that's not what this is about. Yeah. And so when we do our photo shoots, I, I actually take all the photos for the studio because I love to do it and it's so fun. And I have a really good eye for yoga photography and for what looks good. Mm-hmm. And you know, they'll do a pose, they'll be like, oh, let me do that again. It didn't look good. But it's okay. We're not we're not shooting for perfectionism. Because when all we do is showcase perfect yoga poses, mm-hmm. that makes so many people feel like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Mine's not going to look like that. So why Mm -hmm. should I try Mm -hmm. when that's not what it's about at all? And so those things we will not do intentionally, intentionally market specifically just towards white women or showcase perfectionism. Bam. (laughs) I love that. 
I really do. That That's everything that I wanted to ask you. That's the end of my list of questions. Is there anything else that you feel like you want to talk about or say any other sort of messages that you want to send out into the, the ears of people listening or the eyes of people watching? I want to invite everyone to make a change today, commit to making a change today on how they can better increase diversity and inclusion within their yoga community or even their studio. If you're a student at a studio in who's you know, the studio that's mostly has white clients and you see a person of color come in, you be the one to go up to them and say, hi, my name's Sarah. Something as little as that goes so long, such a long way mm. to breaking down these barriers to not othering people and to truly making people feel welcomed, not just saying that they're welcomed. Because you can say whatever you want. You know, we everybody has grown up as kids hearing actions speak louder than words. And if your actions are not backing up your words of inclusion, is there really inclusion? I love that. And that's a really simple <laughs> action that all of us can take. You know, even with a Very mask easy. on, you can smile, you can say hi. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. maybe don't move your mat closer, but you don't have to move it away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Speaking of creepy, sneaking the mat closer. Mm, hey, let's Hi. be friends. But you're right. It's a simple thing to be welcoming, isn't it? And sometimes we forget, I think, what our faces are doing. You know, you yeah. come to, to practice and whatever's been going on in your day is racing around in your mind. And you sometimes forget that there's a, a face reflecting that to the outside. Yes. You can look past people blankly without stopping to go, oh, human being, hey, smile, yeah. welcome. Mm. And, and and I say that because I remember there was a couple of times in Dallas when I was in these packed yoga studios and um, somebody did that to me. Somebody set their mat, mat down to me and went out of their way to introduce themselves to me. And it just made me feel, it made me feel seen. Mm. And it made me feel welcomed and like, okay, somebody's happy that I'm here and wants to talk to me. Um, so on a, on a personal level, I think that's something we can do on a bigger level. We talk about companies. I think it's exactly what you quoted me saying in the scout guide. Mm -hmm. We have to hire more teachers of color, more black teachers, give black teachers the platforms that you typically only see white women on, or and sometimes white men, but mostly white women on. Like Lululemon, when they brought when they bring in teachers to teach at those things, hire a black teacher to do that. Or when we, I don't know if we'll ever get back to the season of yoga festivals. <laughs> it's hard <laughs> to imagine, isn't it? If we ever get back to that, you know, maybe a black woman headlining Wanderlust or something like that. Mm. Those are going to make huge, huge waves. Yes. Yeah. And you never know who that voice will speak to. You know, it's not that we only speak to right. people who look exactly like us. You might just express something in a way that lands in my heart in a way that right. nobody else has. So the more options we right. have, the more variety we have, the more people we draw into the practice, the more people understand its exactly. benefits. Mm, I love it. Which is that. And that's the point. 100% <laughs> to bring people in and yeah. to empower them with the tools that have been so helpful for us. Yes. So if people are interested in what they've heard and they want to know more about you or more about what you do or the Alexa Yoga Lounge, where would you send them? Um, to my Instagram. Mm -hmm. If they want to see the, you know, the picture perfect <laughs> me. I feel um, like your Instagram is pretty real. And it's I also think not traditional real, yoga sure. teacher Instagram either. Yeah. You posted some pretty right. saucy bikini shots the other day that I was like, damn, okay. <laughs> That, with that the text be... sorry does this make you uncomfortable not sorry yeah 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 and and on my on my instagram i, I talk a lot about self-love mm -hmm. which is also a huge part of, of power yoga you, you if you if you keep beating yourself down you're never going to make it through this so at some point you're going to have to learn to accept and to love mm -hmm. what is happening and the more you can do that, the more you can love yourself, which is, you know, the ultimate end game is to love yourself and how you present to the world. 
Um, so that's what that's about. <laughs> right. So they can um, look at my Instagram, which is at Yoga Elixir, um, or they can check out the studio Instagram, which is at Elixir Yoga Lounge. Or if they want to laugh and watch me dance badly, <laughs> <laughs> TikTok and talk about the COVID va- and talk about the COVID vaccine. <laughs> I'm also at Yoga Elixir on TikTok. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your thoughts with everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. It was a blast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Yoga Medicine. If you liked the show, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you got something out of this episode, please spread the word and share it with a friend. You can find more information, articles, trainings, and classes at yogamedicine.com. Check us out on social media as Yoga Medicine, or you can email us at info at yogamedicine.com. Thank you for being part of our Yoga Medicine community. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and is not meant to replace medical care. Please consult your healthcare provider to determine what is best for your unique healthcare needs. 